And in this segment is we have Dennis Navratil, downtown businessman, and we're going to be looking at what I'm going to call the Porter's TIF district. Right, Dennis? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, the what has occurred here is the uh, Porter's, instead of when they close down their store after 150 years, they, they're like a icon or they're a, they're a part of the city, did not just take up and leave. And, and, and the, the council in their, in their meeting, their most recent meeting, uh, said that uh, this was part of their consideration when they uh, put up this facade grant, which was many times more and much greater than what the normal facade grant is. Uh, normally it's about $5,000, they're doing it $160,000. But the question isn't so much around porters and that. It's a, the, the, big, the greater question is, is what's the city doing in with all this real estate redevelopment anyway? And, and you had some thoughts about that, Dennis, one I think that were very interesting. Uh, one of them being that uh, you mentioned to me is that what does it say about the city? That, a, that, a, that a, city has sure. to, a, a company has to have a subsidy from the city in order to survive in Racine? <laughs> well, right. I mean, that is, that is one of the signals that's being sent here is that um, if, I mean, I'm glad that the Porter's folks are reinvesting in their property. Um, but when the city is giving them, I think, $1.1 million plus a facade grant of $160,000, um, and, and basically making the argument that this development wouldn't happen without this $1.4 million or whatever it is, $1.25 million, um, what that's really saying is you can't make it in Racine without massive government uh, subsidy. Um, so what does that tell other people who might be interested in uh, investing in Racine who don't get a subsidy? I mean, that you, you're talking about a very uh, unlevel playing field that they're creating here in Racine. Well, and I, it's a, um, I don't know that it's unlevel playing field from that regard. So, so many cities are in the same situation. And sure. it's unfortunate that our cities have stooped to that level, particularly this one in, that, that we live in. And of course, that's one of the reasons that we and, and you and I and other people are, are working so hard at trying to do some reform here, because we know it doesn't have to be that way. It's, this isn't unique to Racine. It's being done all over. But what, what is also the case is everywhere you go, there's these subsidies. Um, but they can't subsidize everything, right? Sure so only sure certain can. people right. get the subsidies. Yeah, right. Others are left actually making up the difference for those subsidies. Yeah. So on the one hand, you've got certain select individuals or businesses they're getting a great big uh, help from the government, and the others have to pick up the slack. And I'm sorry, but those people who are picking up the slack, eventually they're going to pick up and move, and that is what's happened in Racine over the course of the last 20-some uh, years. I think uh, you've noted in the past that the population of Racine has decreased from... Well, at, our peak, we, at our peak, we were 95,000. We were the third largest city in the state, right behind Milwaukee and Madison. Now we've dropped down to six. Both Green Bay and Kenosha have passed us. We've dropped down to 79,000 people. We've lost 18% of our population. And those are working people. Those are the people on welfare are still sticking around. They don't have to worry about it. The people that left it because they left their jobs. And, and those were our most important people, too, our, our workers. So let me ask you something, George. When, when, um, when, so we've got 16,000 people who've left Racine in the last 20 years, right? Right. Or 30 years, whatever. 1970. Uh, 43 years. Yeah. So a lot of people have left. Let me ask you, George, how many of them either left or, or, or passed away, how many of them took their residential or commercial property with them when they left? <laughs> Unfortunately, none of them. They left it. They left okay. it behind. So it's here. It's still here, right? <laughs> That's right. So we've got a capacity to um, service the housing and commercial needs for 95,000 people. But a lot got, of vacant space. There's a lot sure. of vacant space. So we have to ask, is this a wise strategy for the city of Racine to be adding residential and retail space when we have an overcapacity already? That is a real good question. And, you know, it, it, it's amazing that they operate that way. I've been mm -hmm. look, I'm wondering that for a long time. They, I never hear it come up. We're, we, we've got all these empty spaces around, yet we're building more condos. So, what, so now you can, you can subsidize any place with the tune of a million dollars, and it's going to look great. And they'll maybe fill some tenants in there. But where are those tenants going to come from? They're just going to come from other people in Racine who didn't get the subsidy, other landlords like yourself. So in other words, George, you are going to be borrowing money to fund a project that's going to hurt you personally because you're going to have a harder time finding tenants. <laughs> that's true you, for a lot of people, you, that's right. Yeah. So 
So it's, just, I think it's, just, it is. it's not a wise, it's not a wise. No, what, what you've done is you've increased the tax base for a lot of people, which makes it even more difficult. And that's why we're continuing to lose population too, by sure. the way, folks. It's not like it stopped at 79,000. We're still going down. Mm -hmm. So the, the policies in Racine are, are, are really strange because what they should be doing instead is trying to figure out ways to increase the population, uh, maybe through businesses that hire. Um, and you don't do that by, um, you know, soaking them, borrowing money to, to prop up one or two, um, you know, connected individuals or businesses. I think that's pretty obvious. No, I, 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 you know, this, this whole tip district thing is, is just, it's, it's patchwork. And we, we see it, it's not working, but uh, it, it, it's going to be up to, I would say it's going to be up to people like you and me and other, other people that are concerned about it to start speaking out and saying, hey, it's time to cut down. I believe that on taxes and regulations, because that's what makes it more business viable. Mm -hmm. would, would you say that? Would you agree with that? Sure. Um, yeah, we, I mean, you've got, um, you've got a situation where, um, yeah, you've got a, a few people that are benefiting greatly, and a lot of people who are um, going to be hurting a little bit because of that. And so eventually some of those people are just going to pack up and leave, and, and that continues to put downward pressure on the values of property. When you've got um, 79,000 people looking at 90,000, you know, capacity, they're in the driver's seat. That's going to, in terms of bar, buying or renting, that's going to put downward pressure on the prices of those homes and businesses. Um, and, that's, right. and that's just going to continue as more and more of those people have to pick up the slack for others. Just real quick, quick and close, we've only got a couple sure. seconds left. Okay. What, what do you see as, as, as overall solution? What, 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 where do we need to go? Well, we need to, we need to get out of the real estate business. Uh, because one, you've, you, we're spending money that we don't have. Uh, we're getting into what should be market-based decisions. Um, we're paying people a lot of money in City Hall a lot. to do this, so we're losing money on both ends. We're employing people to do jobs that they shouldn't be doing. Um, the private sector should determine, look, George, if we got, if we filled up to 95,000 people in the city, the real estate situation would take care of itself. In other words, people would move in and spend their own money to build houses and retail. Uh, they're not going to do that now because there isn't any demand for it. So you got the government trying to prop it up when there is no need to prop it up. Good. All right. Let's leave it at that. All right. We're going to take a break here. Next up is John Homerson from the Racine Taxpayers Association. And he's going to explain how yo-yos may be causing global warming. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a minute. <laughs>